Welcome in, everyone, to a very special episode of American Joyride. I am joined today by Mike Edwards. He is a former Army Ranger, and not just an Army Ranger, but he was also a member of the Regimental Reconnaissance Company. We're going to talk about all of that and much more today. Mike, I'm happy to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me. I know it's been a long time coming. We couldn't quite get this together, but we finally made it happen. I know. I actually, actually, it's funny you bring that up because when I was going through my emails this morning to shoot you the Zoom link, I, the first email I saw was from like December of 2023. So yes, yeah, so this has been like eight months in the making. And I want to jump right into the start of it with you. You're an Army Ranger. Can, can you kind of give us the timeline of when you joined the Rangers and then what impact 9-11 had on your career trajectory? Okay. Yeah. So I was actually in Korea when 9-11 happened, the side of the regular Army. Um, I was kind of fed up with the army. I didn't like what I was doing in the army. So I decided um, once 9-11 happened, I was like, man, we're going to war now. That's really the whole reason that I came in the military because I thought, you know, I wanted to defend my country. So I went to the recruiter and re-enlisted and they recommended, actually a friend that was in the unit that I was in recommended that I go to the Ranger Regiment. So that's what I did. Re-enlisted for that. Ended up going to 3rd Ranger Battalion um, after, you know, completing the assessment selection process. Went to 3rd Ranger Battalion and then trained up there and then immediately started deploying because, I mean, as you know, uh, immediately after 9-11, those guys were deploying. So by the time I got to Ranger Battalion in summer of 2002, they had already done two combat deployments. So I was kind of like, God, I'm missing out. You know what I mean? <laughs> Wait, can you compare the training to get to be an Army Ranger to your old unit? Like how rigorous and how tough is Ranger? It was at that time, was it called RIP or was it RASP at that time? It was rip at that time. And uh, when I went through, it was about four weeks long, um, but it was just, it was absolutely brutal. Um, it was more of a selection process than training anything. They just wanted to see if you had the aptitude to be able to hang in Ranger Battalion. Um, so they just, I mean, just brutally smoked the crap out of us, took us on super arduous physical events. And then there was a certain level of standards we had to pass. Like you know, 12 mile ruck march in a certain amount of time, five mile run in a certain amount of time, all these physical attributes we had to achieve, which the standard was higher there than anywhere else in the army for the most part, besides the other, you know, um, soft units. So going through that, testing and proving that you could make it. And then once I got, once you get to the battalion back then was when you really learned the job, like you would learn explosive breaching, how to do CQB, how to raid houses, the way that the battalion does it. So you don't learn that when I went through, you didn't learn that in the selection process. Now they've added a portion to that, like another month after that, where they kind of train some of those basic skills, but they don't go too deep in the weeds because they, each battalion operates slightly differently and each platoon within those battalions operates slightly differently. So they, they put the onus of most of that on the actual battalion that you end up being assigned to. Was there any point when you were going through that program where you thought to yourself, I'm maybe I'm not cut out for this, maybe I physically or mentally, or when you got there, were you pretty confident I'm going to get through this program? Um, I was pretty confident that I wouldn't quit, you know, <laughs> and, and that's, you know, the, the big part of the battle there is not quitting uh, because that's the whole point. They're trying to break you to the point where you're going to give up and quit. And if you do, that's not the kind of guy we want in the Ranger Regiment. Um, passing the physical tasks. I wasn't too worried about that. I was in really good shape. I literally trained for several months before I went to rip. So physically, I knew if I didn't get injured, I could physically make it. It was just whether I could actually tough it out or not. And there were times, uh, there's a portion called Cole range, which for the ranger regiment, it's similar to like hell week for the, for the seals and like buds. Um, it's just brutal. It's an entire week out in the field and they're just destroying you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, for the entire time you're out there. And that's when a lot of guys want to quit. For example, they'll have, uh, they'll be smoking you all day long, making you bear crawl 300 meters to the wood line and back doing land navigation all day, walking eight to 10 miles a day, navigating through the woods. And then in the evening when you're tired, they're smoking you some more. It's raining on you and you're standing in formation and then they're grilling hot dogs on the side over there. And the cadre are like, hey, you guys just want to give up. You know what I mean? Like you can have these hot dogs. We got Coca-Cola's over here, you know, things like that to try, try to lure you out. And you'll see half of the entire formation just sheath off. Like half the dudes will just break off and quit. You know, it's certain phases. It's like that, like big chunks will quit and then nobody will quit for several days and then big chunks will quit. But that's how they weed the guys out over time. 
That's fascinating. That that must be one hell of a mental mind game, just smelling hot dogs as your life is an absolute living hell. That's incredible. Um, and and it really does speak to the mental resiliency a resiliency you need to make it through. We, so you said you get there in summer of 2002. You finally have gone through the selection. And do you, remind me, do you do a deployment to Afghanistan before Iraq kicks off, or was your first deployment to Iraq? My first deployment was to Iraq. Yeah, I got there in 2002, um, trained up, did some stuff, hadn't even gone to ranger school yet. And then we deployed to Iraq in uh, March, I believe, of 03, um, jumped in and did the airfield seizure on the Western Desert of Iraq. So so let's talk about that. That is really what I want to, because I know Iraq was so much of your career. When you get, when you find out you're going to Iraq, when you find out the invasion is happening, did you stage in Saudi Arabia? We did. Yeah, so, we stayed in an air base down in Saudi Arabia for probably two weeks to a month or so beforehand. Yeah. So walk the viewers through kind of like you said, you wanted to join to defend your country. You wanted to join to go to war. And now this is the opportunity. This is showtime for you. First time. What emotions do you remember feeling? Were you excited? Were you nervous? Walk us through what, what you were feeling at the time. Well, to me, it was like a dream come true. You know, like I'm in an airborne infantry special operations unit. So every dude there wants to jump into combat, you know, and hunt the enemies of our country. So here I was in in um, uh, Saudi Arabia planning and we're training and training and training and planning and planning different mission sets, waiting to, te to, to find out which one we're actually going to execute. And the mission set that comes across our table is an airfield seizure, jump in and seize an airfield. And, you know, all the Rangers are just like, I mean, grinning ear to ear. They're like, this is perfect. I'm going to jump into combat like they did in World War II. You know, like not Rangers, but other guys that jumped in during World War II and like other wars. Um, so we were super stoked about that. But at the time, a little bit scared as well, because, you know, I've never been to combat. You know, um, a lot of the guys there have been to some deployments, but this was different. You know, we're going into a place that has like you know, air to air capabilities and stuff like that. And we're going to be flying in big planes, jumping out and seizing airfields. So there was a, a high chance that we would all get shot down um, on the jump in, but we were planning and we were ready to execute. So let's walk, walk us through what you just said about their air to air defenses. What were their capabilities realistically by the time you're going to do the jump? Had their, had their air defenses been taken out yet or were they, were they opening fire on planes still? Yeah, they were still opening fire on planes. I mean, there were A-10s. There were stories of A-10s coming in from doing gun runs and coming out with bullet holes all in them. So they had a significant threat to air assets still at that time. Um, you know, the reports for us, we were going to jump in initially on um, Baghdad International Airport, the big you know airport there in Baghdad. And they estimated that we would probably receive 75% casualties before we even got out of the plane. Like they were thinking that a lot of our planes were going to get shot out of the sky as we flew in. So what happened was they ended up shifting the plan. And instead of jumping in there, we jumped in elsewhere and then moved to other objectives from there. On that jump, how much resistance did you guys face when you hit that airfield? None. Absolutely none. Yeah. It was the craziest thing. Like we're expecting this huge fight, uh, jump out of the plane. I remember we flew in we, we jumped pretty low, like in training uh, in the Ranger Regiment, like a low jump is considered about 800 feet. This seemed like it was at least that low, if not lower. I've heard that we jumped at like 500 feet. I don't know if that's true or not. All I know is it was dark. I jumped out of the plane. My gas mask that I had on my body ended up slipping between my legs. So I was trying to get it sorted out so that I could put my feet and knees together and be prepared to land. And as soon as I got it freed, uh, I pretty much hit the ground at that point. So we weren't too high up. That that's absolutely incredible. It's like uh, that scene in Band of Brothers when they're jumping on D-Day and says, if we get any lower, we're not going to need parachutes. Um, yeah. That's the so, way it was. We were jumping heavy, heavy, heavy rucksacks. I mean, most guys' rucksacks were weighing over 100 pounds. So we're max loading these uh, parachutes. A lot of guys ended up getting hurt on the jump. I think 10 or 11 guys from my company and the strike force we were assigned to got hurt. Um, but then we saw some vehicles, speaking about the resistance, we saw some vehicles that uh, were there at the compound we were seizing, they just took off and left. So we could see the headlights driving away. Like they were like a bunch of guys just jumped out of the sky. Let's get the heck out of here. So there was no fight. We cleared this massive compound, which took well into the daylight hours to finish because we had one company of Rangers um, and then some attachments as well. So you're talking, you know, hundred plus guys 
total, but assaulters, you're, I don't know, you know, three platoons worth of assaulters there. So 60 to 80 guys assaulting, and we cleared this massive oil refinery type compound um, all by ourselves. And it took almost into like midday to do that, but not a single person was even found. So when you, when you clear that compound, do you hand that off into some other unit so you guys can keep rolling on to the next objective? Typically we do that. Um, but for that one, we expanded that airhead line. We created basically an entry point. So that's one of the Ranger Regiment's primary missions is forcible entry. We achieve a foothold into a country with an airfield, and then we secure that so that more follow-on forces can come in. So we opened up the airhead. We had you know combat controllers out there controlling air assets. We brought in C-130s and C-17s, landing them on the airstrip that we jumped in on. And then that brought in like Delta Force dudes and like SAS dudes and all kinds of stuff that were out there, started coming to this base. And then we started planning missions. And it ended up being like a big joint operations center where we planned operations out of, at least for the element that I was with. I love that. Do you remember the first time you pulled the trigger and was it on that deployment? It was. Um we had a mission to go do what they call mock interdiction, which is lines of communication interdiction. So there was fuel trucks and stuff like that, that we were reported were coming up this highway. So we were supposed to ambush them. So we ended up ambushing a couple of fuel trucks, shooting the trucks up. They ended up blowing up, catching on fire. And then there was a couple of times where we had to stop where we had uh, experienced some IEDs, you know, the very first Rangers that died in combat. Well, not the ones, the first ones that died in combat, the first ones that died in Iraq died on that deployment through uh, a woman and her husband that came up with a baby acting like they wanted water and they detonated the car, blew up a bunch of our people. So after that, we were kind of sketched out about cars coming up on us real fast. So we stopped some cars. Uh, I tried to stop some cars this one time and they just wouldn't stop. They just started speeding up coming towards us. So we we shot the car up, but it, was the, it wasn't like I personally saw a person and, and engaged them myself. I just engaged more of like an area target with other people. Um, but I got to fire my gun the first time I went to combat. So that was kind of cool. One of the things that I find interesting and I like hearing different opinions and it goes to kind of like the first time you pull the trigger is I've heard a lot of guys say one of the big misconceptions that maybe the public has is this idea that if you kill someone in war, it like stays with you forever. And you think about it all the time. And a lot of the guys who've been on this show, they're like, that's not true for, for me. It's like, I don't think about it. It's like, I just did my job for you when it came to, to pulling the trigger in combat, th is that something that was tough or was it just another day in the job? It was, um, you know, I chalk it up to the training that we did. We were so accustomed to, to bringing that rifle up to a threat and engaging it, that it was just like second nature. I didn't really think anything of it. I think the first time you see an actual dead body killed, you're like, Oh, this is real. You know what I mean? That's about the most that it really affected me. And even to this day, looking back on it, I don't really regret it, even though, you know, there may have been some guys that we shot that necessarily may have not been bad guys. Um, we were just trying to do the best that we could do. And, you know, it never has bothered me, to be honest with you. Yeah. And, and the reason I ask that is because it seems the guys from the special operations world, they all give the exact same answer. You know, some will say, I wish I could have had that one back because it just got a little too chaotic and, and things happen, but yeah, they all say the same thing that this misconception that you can't sleep forever. It's you think about it for the next 30 years or like not for us. I think that could be the case for some people. Like I think, uh, I think PTSD, like legitimate, like PTSD that hurts people, I think is a lot less prevalent in the special operations community. And I think it's because of the mindset going into it. Like we went into it knowing that we we're going to be involved in combat. We knew the guys were going to get killed and that we were going to see other people killed, you know, by our own hand. So I think that lessens the blow a little bit. I think we do experience issues when it comes to like operator syndrome and stuff like that from constantly being ramped up. Uh, but I think the actual, the killing piece doesn't seem to affect us, at least from what I've seen, just like you mentioned, you know, I think it's less prevalent in the soft world. And we're going to talk about operator syndrome. I'm glad you brought that up. We're going to talk about that later in the interview because I, I definitely want to get your thoughts on that topic. Um, so you, you, I know you had a second uh, deployment where things got really, really hairy or intense. When you get home from the first deployment, though, were you thinking, man, that was everything I hoped it was? Was it disappointing that maybe you didn't get to do more things? What were you feeling when you finally got to decompress a little bit after that first deployment? Honestly, uh, a little bit kind of let down 
uh because i mean we did i got to shoot my gun a few times um like that those ambushes and then another time engaging and some pressing some guys but it just like it wasn't just what i thought you know i said man is this it like i mean so yeah i i got a taste of war and combat but i was just ready for more you know um and i was you know and i would see that later on but it actually took a while i think the next deployment i don't think i even fired a shot or, or i don't think really anybody did that i was with and then it took like another deployment or two before I got a chance to actually see what I thought real combat would be like. 